So what uh, I want to do today, if you see the report, is to uh, deal with two late medieval figures, Dutch scooters and William of Arthur, who represent something of a reaction against what they see as the untoward influence of Greek philosophy. Indeed, what they see as Greek determinism are the untoward influence of this on Christian thought. Um, Dutch scooters are Franciscan, very much concerned about uh, Greek determinism. And so he comes towards a more voluntaristic view of personality, both human and other. Now, when I say a voluntaristic view of personality, uh, what I'm doing is referring to the fact that on the matter of will and intellect, in will and intellect, there are really two main alternatives that are developed, voluntarism and intellectualism. The one obviously stressing the primacy of will and the other stressing the primacy of intellect. But the question is, when uh, one chooses to do something, is that, ch that uh, choice, is that decision, is that action um, a result of intellect or a will free from intellectual demand, assessment, And both Scopes and I uh, read Aquinas as an intellectualist in this episode. They take that is to say that God acts in accordance with eternal forms, eternal arguments. <coughs> so the God's act of creation was not, in that sense, free from anything other than from being chips. And in regards to human nature, the moral action, in the moral psychology of Thomas Aquinas, moral action is again done by the intellect, what one perceives as good, and that consequently one is not free uh, from those uh, moral causes. So this is a concern, and the feeling is that this compromises in the first instance uh, the sovereignty of God, uh, which is saying the will of God, and compromises in the second case the responsibility of humans, and that is to say their freedom of choice. So um, how does all this come together? Well, you may have um, gleaned, if you've been trying to read those stories, that there is good reason why he was called the Sun Doctor. And because his uh, writing is anything more difficult to figure out than the Thomas Aquinas. But uh, I think we can get a handle on it. If we um, go back to the overall shape of the philosophical worldview with which um, Thomas Aquinas has left, namely the emphasis on a hierarchy of being, where each degree of being and goodness in the hierarchy is in accordance with the, the, the essential forms of things that make up the whole hierarchy of creation. Uh, that is to say, as much as this is a hierarchy without gaps and without arbitrariness, and the forms are essential in the sense that they could not be otherwise, the whole hierarchical pattern is seen as something which represents ontological necessity. It's a hierarchy of being which could not be otherwise. It's the necessary shape that being takes. Uh, humans could not be otherwise than where they are on a hierarchy of being. And nothing would be anywhere else that is on a hierarchy of being. Because in the juxtaposed interrelationship of the creation as a whole, everything has its appropriate place in the form. Now, that kind of universe is what the problem is. Scotus sees it initially and tries to modify the picture. Adam sees it clearly and rejects the hierarchy of the together. Now, how does Scotus modify this? Well, first of all, he tries to affirm what he calls the unicity of being, rather than the analogy of being. And if you're alert to those distinctions between the way in which words can be credited, univocally, analogically, or equivocally, you would see quickly that what he's doing is proposing that the word being should be used univocally of all things, rather than analogically. That's to say that the word being is such that it refers to simply what is, is it? not to degrees of something and degrees of qualities. There may be degrees of goodness, degrees of order, degrees of beauty, but that doesn't mean to say that these are degrees of being, degrees of is, something is or innate. Is that simple? And in that sense, of that reason, the being has one and only one meaning. It's not a range of analogical. So you miss it, the being. Now, um, at times, uh, he was misunderstood. Uh, in the 17th century, he was misunderstood as talking of the unity of being. And to speak of the unity of being is to say that there is only one all inclusive being, which would be a pantheistic kind of position, which is not what Scotus was asserting. He's very clear about that. Uh, but he's not asserting that being is one, that the meaning of, quote, being is one. And not the reference being refers to one and only one being, one puts not the reference of the word being, but the underlying concept of being. The word does not have a variety of analogous meanings. One and only one sense. So the universe, the unicity of university, if you like, of being. Um, now in this word, he is breaking the necessity that things be arranged in a, in a particular hierarchy that is in the way they are. They're arranged according to order of goodness, not according to their order of degree of being. And uh, accordingly, the determinism that uh, he thinks is broken. Oh. God could have made other creations arranged differently. The creation is contingent in its being and in its order on the way God chose to make it. That does not mean to say that God is completely arbitrary and unthinking. Oh, he chooses reasonably, but it is dependent on his choice. 
Now, the one corollary of this uh, invisibility thing, uh, namely that God knows things, not through their forms as archetypes in his mind, which he can contemplate indirectly, have an idea of creatures, but God knows beings directly as the kinds of beings they are, because there is no differentiation between beings qua beings. There is one concept, being. And so a direct awareness of all particular beings that he was making. Direct awareness of all particular beings. Now, what business of a direct knowledge of the beings, direct knowledge of particular beings, uh, is significant uh, not only because it shows that uh, God is actively involved, it makes that intelligible, but because there is to be a direct knowledge of things outside of the divine mind, in contrast to archetypes within the divine mind. For there to be direct knowledge of things outside the divine mind, there must be a kind of mental intentionality. And this word intentionality becomes very significant. We've got the notion of intention in um, the double intention of Thomas Epps. But here's the claim that in God's knowing, God engages in an act of intentionality. What is that? An act of external reference of mentally referring to, mentally pointing out to yourself, something external to the mind. Now you see special human knowledge as well. Then it becomes a game And incidentally, that's the kind of intentionality that uh, I assume uh, Dallas Willard's going to be talking about in the um, Thursday morning philosophy of mind. Intentionality is an external reference, act of the mind, in directly apprehending things external to the mind. Um, pause there for a um, part of the development of anti-realism in a epistemology in modern times has been due to the fact, and I, I say part of it, part of it has been due to the fact that knowledge was understood as a byproduct of behavioral stimuli. And that's to say, sense stimuli provoke the change in the state of consciousness, which is a byproduct of those sense stimuli. The mind being simply a passive recipient of such states of consciousness. How then we know this something stimuli? And David Hume, that's why he became um, the same because of anything beyond our present experience. Now, the other part of the uh, anti realism is due not to that uh, behavior state of consciousness, but rather to the subjectivity involved, the subjective grids that are there, and superimposed on that consciousness. Now, if there is subjective grid that is brought to bear, then it's likely to reshape the way things would otherwise appear. We don't know what they are in the other. So, in either case, the because of behavior is more because of subjectivism, there's a problem of uh, uh, answering the question how do we know that what we know is real? So, if it can be argued that there is a direct awareness of the reality, by virtue of a mental act that's able to transcend the limitations of one's own inner consciousness and reach outside. Uh, then the affirmation of a knowledge of reality is possible. And this is where it is discussed. Uh, this is the way it was for the Scottish realism of the 18th century. This is the way it was for a lot of 20th century realism. And so we'll be watching for this theme of a mental act. There's a lot of mental idealism in the idealist philosophies of the 19th century. And when the reaction against idealism set in in the early 20th century, uh, one of the main um, arguments against it on the part of some British and American philosophers was in terms of this act of external weapons. The mental act of intentionality. Where did they get that idea? They got it from German philosophy. And people like Brett Tano was one of the phenomenologists in the early 20s, along with um, Edmund Rousseau. And then Dallas Willard here, these other certain specialists. So he brings it straight from the German philosophy of Nazi. Instead, via the British and Indians. Okay, that's another question. So watch this uh, scotistic emphasis on intentionality. Okay. Uh, when it's direct apprehension, direct awareness of the teachers. All right, now that's the first ingredient in his modification to the Christianized Aristotelian as well Thomas. Second, how do we account for individuality? How do we account for individuality? Now, you recall that again, there's been a variety of positions on this. The tendency in the past has been the same in the Thomas tradition, that individuality is a privation of form. And since there are various privations of form, there are various individuals, all of them lacking the fullness of their nature in some regard. But that gives no positive value to individuality. And particularly in Judeo Christian thought rather than Neo Platonic thought, that's a problem. From the Neo Platonic, it's not so much. We're having a lose individuality in this So um, the Aristotelian tradition became attractive with its notion that in some way matter individuals. That by virtue of having a space time location, okay, the embodied form is the individual, by the essence of that material existence. Um, for Aquinas, that wasn't quite sufficient. Because Aquinas wanted to give positive value to matter because it's something that God created. And you remember, therefore, that Aquinas speaks of matter as pure potency. But that is to say, matter has potential for a whole choreographed variety of this connection. Positive that intention. And that potential is drawn out by virtue of the natures which God provides with matter in the act. So individuality, then, is by act of God drawing out the particular potencies of the matter. Now, so is still not satisfied. Uh, it sounds as if uh, matter still individuates. And if matter is what do, is doing the individuation, whereas rational soul is immaterial, however, an immaterial rational soul is released from the body the individual. And furthermore, if God is an immaterial spirit, how can God be individual? Then matter is individuals. So what um, often, uh, what Scotus proposes 
is that uh, whereas the thorn gives the quidditus, that is to say, the whatness of the thing, is related to the thorn. It's generic thing. What species is, is a member? On the other hand, the individual nature of the thing, its thisness, is provided by a third form, a third kind of principle, uh, other than matter and form. A principle he calls hycaetas. Hycaetas simply being the Latin for what thisness. Any of you take Latin here in Iceland? So a few of you know about pink, white, 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 conjugating the demonstrative program this. Um, all right, uh, hycaetas, you see, has the height of the uh, demonstrative program this. Hycaetas is thisness. Thisness. Individuality. This particular. This particular person. Not human in general. But this okay. So that the, the particular is a result not of two principles brought together by God, form and that, but three principles. Form, form, and hypothesis. Though he keeps in mind carefully the Aristotelian conjoiner, although these three are not actually separated, at least in this life, they always come constant. They always come constant. In that sense, the distinction is said to be purely form, rather than material. A form distinction. What would be making that thought? Rather than three things you can separate out themselves. So that individuality is due to the principle business. And you have emphasis on individuals whose individual identity is not determined either by form of species or by matter, bodily matter generically. But there is an individualized identity. And it's the Hikea fast that makes possible the freedom of the individual's will. Because the individual's will is not generic. It's not a byproduct of material process. Individual's will. So uh, in those ways, he tries to uh, reinforce the freedom of the will of God in creating by modifying the hierarchy of it. And he tries to uh, reinforce the freedom of the human will by modifying the picture of individuality. And with those changes to the underlying metaphysical in mind, then now we can see what he does with the will and intellect issue, which is the source of all speech. Okay. He has a more voluptuistic view of God. He has a more voluptuistic view of human nature. What are the implications? Well, take logic. Take logic. Uh, yeah, uh, but um, uh, in, in the case of Aristotelian logic, you remember how Aristotle yes, um, developed the um, developed the syllogism, but uh, draw our attention that with such to the fact that with such demonstrative reasoning, the big problem we had is of establishing the first premises, the first principles from which syllogistic reasoning proceeds. And you recall how, according to Aristotle, one gains knowledge of those first principles. That is to say, by abstracting the first principle of species from your cumulative experience of all species. So according to Aristotle, you can have assured knowledge by means of this intuitive abstraction. You can have assured knowledge of first principles and immediately deductive demonstrative reasoning, run assumptions. If you have the first principles of the species, you can infer all sorts of other things apart concerning the next species, individual species. All men are Socrates is a man, then you know he is dead. As I didn't have to say God. Now, um, the problem that, uh, that Scotus sees, the problem that Scotus sees, is with this claim that uh, first principles for logical demonstration are that rarely accessible. And the reason for that is that um, in a world where individuals are what they are because of hycaetas, business, the distinction between species may not be always that clear. At the best, you would have some probability oh, concerning the nature of species. So that your syllogistic arguments would never lead you to logical certainty, but only to varying degrees of probability. Uh, accordingly, natural theology, if possible, would be only a certain probability is limited by the nature of the rest. But he is not unduly alarmed at that, because if we have a direct knowledge of particular things, then we're able to examine particular things as particulars more carefully and find similarities. And so the probability of that kind of examination of particulars